Okay, so I have washed and dried the fabric for the apron, the ruffles. Put this over here. Here is that fabric right here. Just beautiful. It is 100% cotton. What I plan to do is measure based on the pattern. I know I think it's piece number 10 that I need to use. I know it's not five, not two. Nine is, all right, so nine is the ruffle and 10 is the waistband. Okay, so here is waistband and ties. And for that you cut three and you cut it on the bias. And for the ruffle, we put this on the fold and we will cut three. Okay, so three on the fold. Now here's the truth. I am not going to cut, I don't know if you can see, yeah, I'm not gonna stop cutting here because that just seems like a waste of a little tiny band of fabric to me. And my fabric is tearing straighter than I could probably cut. So I'm gonna, this. There's one ruffle. And the second ruffle. Ooh, it's getting time to get a new pair of scissors. <laughs> and the third ruffle. One. Two. And three. Now I will be cutting off the Selvages because they are t more tightly woven than the center of the fabric. So I'm just going to go ahead and take a rotary cutter and ruler and just cut that off. And I'm hanging on to that. That's pretty cute. I'll put that right in there. Okay. So they're going to be slightly longer than the pattern indicated, but that just means more ruffles, and there can't be anything wrong with more ruffles. If you just joined me, the reason that I fold my pattern piece with the number out is so that I can find it quickly and I always underline either the nine or the six and I don't I'm not using pattern number six in the pattern that I've cut out which is view E from McCall's fashion accessories pattern number M5284 and so I because I was going to use nine I decided to underline it that way I knew it was the one I needed so back in there that goes, and now it's time 
to take care of this. Now this pattern piece has not been completely cut. I need to press it and then I need to trim it just a little bit better. So 36 times 3 is what I'll be cutting. So it's 36 3 times 3 inches wide on the bias. And I know it's on the bias because look at that grain line. Instead of going this way, it's at a 45 degree angle. So if I put this arrow on 45, which is this line right here, I don't think you can see that. It says 45, and I'll get you down where there, there's actual visibility. 45. So I'm going to put the end of this arrow at the end of the 45 degree mark right there. I'm lining it up and it is right on that 45 degrees. So that helps me. I know that it is a bias cut. Now that I've got these strips cut, I think I have enough, but what I have to do next is I have short pieces and long pieces, and I have to make three that are 36 inches. Okay, so the way this goes is you have one piece of your bias strip right here face up horizontally in front of you, and then you have another strip face down vertically on the corner like so. Now if you have a triangle template that's great. I don't. And then you can pin I think for safety's sake I will. Okay and then I'm just going to stitch from there to there. But how am I supposed to see that right there? Well I can't. So I'm going to fold this like so, and finger press. I don't want to stretch it. I just, I just want a line right there. Okay, and I'm just going to stitch right along that folded line. So this is what we now have. I know that I don't want this it's very bulky. So I'm just going to line that up. Okay. Okay, yes. I was off just a little bit, but I haven't pressed it yet. No, it's perfect. There we go. I just need to press. So I have one, two, three, four. 
And the basic idea is that we were going to have 36 inches times 3. And then I decided that they can be longer. It's not going to be an issue. I'm going to go press these, but I need to read what type of pressing is required for the waistband and the ties. But we don't, apparently, we don't start with that. We start with making the ruffle. Okay, so let's go back and look at those instructions. We'll have one raw edge. Way over there. And then we'll take these two and stitch right sides together. And these two right sides together. So let me go take care of that. So the way they have us doing this uh, ruffle is to me it's backwards. They want us to do the gathering first along the top edge of these three pieces and then do a 5 8 inch narrow hem on the lower edge. But it would be more difficult to make the lower to make the hem when this is gathered. So I am going to do the hem first. All right, so I've been gone about an hour and it occurred to me that one of my favorite hymns, <laughs> H-E-M-S, is a roll and whip and then just fold. And you could easily do this with a serger. If you have a serger, you could just serge one end and then, you know, fold it up and then stitch it down, like I'm going to do, but I'm not going to use my serger. Okay, so I just wanted to point that out. Alrighty, now what I plan to do here is I'm going to trim the lower edge with my pinking shears. I haven't pressed it, but this is the hem. I've done it all the way across. This is the right side, obviously, and this is the wrong side. And that's what the hem looks like. Okay, so when you're gathering your ruffles for this pattern, you want to do two rows of very long stitches. I'm keeping this quilting weight thread in my sewing machine because it's a heavier duty thread and it won't break as easily. So we're going to do two rows to this first seam where we seamed these three pieces together we have these seams so right here I will stop and I will have just two rows on this one section and then I'll start another two rows on this middle section until I get to this seam and I'll stop and then I will start two final rows to the end where I will then of course stop Okay, so next we need to continue reading the instructions for view E. And that is going to be right here. So we've done all of this, the ruffle, the ruffle, the ruffle. Now we've done the hem. Now we need to ruffle. This is basically what we're going to be doing. We're going to be gathering these ruffles and distributing them around the lower edge and side edges of the apron. Okay, and that would be done right sides together. So, we'll start up here at this top edge right here. That'll be our first place to pin. And the other thing you want to do is make sure you pull the needle thread, not the bobbin thread, when you're gathering your gathers.
supposed to start pinning the ruffle, which is right there. My apron will be longer because you may recall if you've been following along, I made my apron an inch longer when I cut it out. Alright, so we're just going to continue all the way around, and this is right here pretty much what it's going to look like. So that's one side. I'm holding the top, of course. And we're going to go across to the other side. I think it's quite cute. And I'll just go ahead and get that stitched. And probably what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and stitch this ruffle to the fabric, the apron fabric. And then I'm going to go back and on top of that, I'm going to zigzag all the way around just to keep these raw edges happy. Good morning. This morning I am going to finish up the apron, but I wanted to let you guys know I had ordered four yards of, I believe it's 60 inches wide, uh, just basic white broadcloth, but it's four yards. I just can't remember if it was 45 inches wide or 60 inches wide, um, mainly because I wanted to have backing fabric for projects moving forward, either for lining, for backing, whatever. It's just a good product to have, and it's less than $5 a yard. So based on the heft of this, I'm going to have to say it's 60 inches wide. Um, let's see. Here's the salvage. Oh yeah, it is definitely a 60 inch wide four yard cut. That's really nice. It's nice to have that on hand. So, you know, the total, including tax, was $21. Yeah, you know, it's just not bad to have that on hand. That's a lot of fabric. Okay, now today is get the apron done. Now, half of this video will have already been filmed and edited. I did part of the video two days ago, and then I edited yesterday. But it's the same project. All right. So the last time we talked about the apron, for me two days ago, for you a second ago, it was the ruffle, which has been stitched on. And the next thing I need to do is pull all of my gathering threads. And if I have done this in the best possible way, it should just be a simple matter of pulling the longest thread because the longest thread will be the needle thread and it will just slide right out. So there should be two for each of the three sections.
has been done. And as you can see, it looks really nice. The, the ruffles turned out just perfect. I do need to, to press, but I think before I press, I do want to go ahead, as I mentioned before, and I'm gonna just carefully trim along this lower edge with my pinking shears, and then I'm going to do a zigzag stitch over the top, just to help keep this from becoming a mess when it comes time to wash it. And aprons get washed a lot. I'm just going to zigzag over this and then I'm going to, after I do the zigzag stitch of course, I'm going to press just up to the ruffle with my iron and also I'm going to go ahead and press these seams. I think I will press them open so that the bulk will be eliminated like so. Like that, I'm going to use my iron. I also wanted to show you something. When you're doing a zigzag stitch like I'm doing, where you've got a ruffly fabric, put your flat piece of fabric next to the, the bed of your machine. If you try to do it this way, where you've got the ruffles on this part, the tendency is for the ruffles to, as you're going along, to get wadded up and you could end up with a situation like this where you've got a zigzag caught on a piece of the ruffle like that. It's a lot easier to just put the flat piece down, in this case the body of the apron. One other thing I wanted to talk about is when you stitch over a zigzagged section of fabric with a domestic sewing machine, you're going to have a massive amount of lint. So after you have done whatever stitching it is, that you needed to do, I recommend I'm dropping my feed dog so that I can remove this plate right here. Okay, so remove your throat plate. Now, I don't know if you can see, but if you've been with me for a while, you know I clean George every day. And for me, that right there is intolerable. I, I can't handle that. A small brush, about this size. I also have a different brush that got put in backwards. It's a little bit more round, so I have these two small ones, and then I have these two larger ones and they're just paint brushes that I have cleaned thoroughly and then don't ever use to paint with again. Alright so my first order of business is to clean off the lint that has accumulated on this throat plate and I just brush it off both sides and then set that aside. I'm going to remove my bobbin case and check it out. Use a smaller brush to kind of get down in there and 
get the lint off. Okay, and then I work kind of top down. That's usually how I manage this. So I'm going to take a piece of paper and set it underneath this area right here. Go ahead and unthread the sewing machine. It may seem like a lot, but this doesn't take as long as it does to pack this machine up and take it to a service center and wait all those days for it to be cleaned and then go back and pick it up. This takes nothing compared to that. Okay. I do like to go ahead and clean off the foot that I'm using as well. If it's on here and I don't clean it off, it'll end up down there. And I don't know if you can see the lint falling, but it is. Remember, thread will create lint. Okay. And let's just see if you can see. I doubt it. I can see it. There's a quite a large accumulation of little lint pieces on this piece of paper. Okay, now for the fun part. Down in here, this area, I just take this brush that I'm holding in my hand that I doubt will be in focus, and I just stab it onto the large pieces like so, and then pull it off and throw it in the garbage. And I do not attempt to collect more than one pass at a time. Now, if you have not cleaned your sewing machine, oh, sorry. If you've not cleaned your sewing machine, say since the pandemic, you may open it to find that it has what looks like little felt pads. There should not be anything in here other than what you're looking at right now. Sewing machines do not have felt pads. So pull all of that out because it is not supposed to be there. So now that my machine has been cleaned up, I do need to wipe off the lint. It's amazing how much lint, fabric, and thread will deposit as you're sewing. And if you can keep it off your sewing machine, then you can keep it, you know, from getting down in here, which we do not want. Okay, so I'm now at that stage where I have zigzagged all the way around, and I'm going to press, and then we're going to look at that waistband and tie situation. The instructions tell us to fold one waistband section in half and match the ends. Basically what that means is you're going to take these short ends, and by short I mean this, this section right here, and you're going to match them up like so. 
to get where the center of the waistband is. So for me, it's right here. If you do not want a seam right in the center of the waistband like I will have, you will have to cut your bias binding to 36 inches without having to seam it. So you'll have to find that long section, that 45 degree angle on your fabric. Or you will have to cut a middle piece and then have the seams down closer to the end of the edge of the top of the waistband, which would be right here. I'm absolutely not bothered by the fact that there's going to be a seam in the middle. It's almost invisible. Okay, so we're going to match or mark that just finger press and then right there in that where that fold is, put a pin or mark it with some type of removable ink. And then also the center of the top edge of your apron will need to be marked. So we have those two things taken care of. The next step is to fold each tie end along the roll line and that will be on your pattern piece which I'll show you and that solid line right in the middle of this pattern piece is the roll line but let's fold it in half along the roll line on this piece of paper and see what we get okay they are literally that's dead center. So you can just fold right in half. And if you want to press, go ahead. But just remember not to twist or move your iron. Just press, lift, press, lift. This is all bias and it will stretch horribly. And the way this is going to look, once we start to stitch, we're going to stitch right here. I believe it is... 5 eighths of an inch. It would be 5 eighths of an inch from the end right here and then right along here all the way down until you get to 5 inches from this other end. So I'm going to go ahead and mark that 5 inches. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is right here. And that's my clue that I need to stop sewing right there. Okay. The reason you don't want to do it, you don't want to sew after that. After you hit this, is we're going to open this out and stitch this to the waistband, and it needs to be opened out all the way. All right. So there's one. I need to do two of these. With these two straps stitched, all I have to do now is remove my landmark pins, which I want to do right away because I have a bad habit of really stabbing myself with pins, so I'm going to get rid of those quickly. All right, and then I'm going to trim the thread of right, for off of each of those. Okay, so now I'm going to trim this with my pinking shears and I'm going to trim the little corner right there on both. So they look like that. And I am going to take my skewer and just twist this like so and push my push the skewer into it with the flat end. If you have a, a chopstick, you can do the same. Thing that I'm doing just you know be careful you don't want this to go through your fabric or 
you know, through the seam or any of that business. I don't think that. Now it will need to be pressed. And just gently push that through. Like so. We will now be pressing or stitching the ties to the waistband. Meanwhile, so check to make sure that your the waistband of your apron stops at the seam where the ruffle and the top waist area of the apron meet up. That's where you want that waistband to stop. Okay, that all fits. So I will remove it now and then attach the waist ties And remember I showed you these go this way. Oh, no they don't. They go right sides together. Okay. Okay. I'm going to go get that stitched. And I'll return. All right, so here it is, all stitched with all the pieces together. And next, we are going to attach with the wrong, with the right side of the waistband centers matched. I think there is a missing step, and I think that missing step is fold the waistband in half. And it sure does not say that. Yeah, that would be the only way that this would work. So they've left out the step where you would fold the waistband and the tie end in half, and then stitch it, and then flip it around to create a waistband. So that's the way I'm going to interpret it because they're showing this waistband folded right sides together. That's what that white fabric right there, or that white, what is supposed to indicate fabric. But if you stitched it with the wrong side of the fabric of the waistband to the right side of the fabric of the apron, your waistband is not going to magically turn right side out. It's always going to be wrong side out. So that is a mistake. So we are going to take the, and this business right here is far too fiddly for me as well. I don't care for this. There are so many easier ways to make a waistband for an apron, but we're going to pin this folded in half from the top of the ruffle across with right sides together. Just fold it in half. Like so and pin it. 
and then we're going to stitch it down of it opened out that's the width of it folded in half and they're showing a stitch right along the top and then when you turn it it magically will flip to the right side but that is not how that's going to work if you follow those directions okay I'm gonna stitch all the way across and when I come back I will flip this over and we're gonna see what that looks like um, at this point I don't know Well, okay, so here's the thing. Once you get this stitched at the waist, this is what you have. This, this is the waistband. It just folds up. And the ties are at the end of the ruffles. This apron is basically a full wrap around. So it goes all the way across the front and this right here covers all the way around your hip and then the ties are long enough that they wrap around in the back and come around to the front and tie in a bow. There are just never enough aprons in my world. <clears throat> I think that the next one I make I'm gonna make for outside for gardening there we go. So four and a half dandelions. I love it. It's great. And it's going to go in the pattern box behind me. And I'm, I can't wait to use it. It's just adorable. I love the way the back comes together like, like this. And you've got that fall of ruffles. may not be the neatest presentation, but that's what it's going to be. And then there's the front. Alrighty. Well, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you haven't already subscribed, please consider doing so. I would love to have you join us. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.